Well, good morning, everybody. Pastor Dave has been leading us through the Steps series. And the deacons have some of these journals. In the beginning of the journal is a little bit of information, but most of the journal is blank. It's for you to write notes. Even if you're just a visitor today, and this is the only time you're ever gonna be here, I encourage you to get one of these journals. If you're a young person and you'd like to maybe draw some pictures in it to remind yourself of things from the sermon, I also encourage you to get one of these journals. So just raise your hand as the deacons come around and they can make sure that you get one. We're gonna be covering some amazing topics today, topics that have been very meaningful to me, and I suspect you're gonna wanna write some notes. So make sure and get one of those journals. Pastor Dave is out for a couple of weeks, and I have the privilege and opportunity to share a sermon today from the first verses of Romans 8. Now I am an engineer by trade, a mechanical engineer, and I design medical devices. One of the previous things that I worked on in my last job before the current one I'm in was implants for spine fusion procedures. Now the cutting edge of technology right now is 3D printed or additively manufactured porous implants. And if you get the pore size right, it encourages bony ingrowth. The, the bone will actually grow into the implant and lock it all in place. This is something like it is with Christ. We are implanted into his body and then he grows into us, so to speak. We abide in him and he abides in us. This is the key point from these first verses in Romans 8. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Then in verse eight, it goes on. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now this is fascinating, because not only are we to dwell in the spirit, to dwell in Christ, but the spirit is to dwell in us. How does this happen? I enjoy backpacking. I used to use iodine tablets before I got a water filter. And with the iodine tablets, it's a two-step process. First, you put the iodine portion of it in, and it dissolves in the water, kills the bacteria, but it makes the water very unpleasant tasting, and it turns the water brown. On the other hand, then you take a tablet that neutralizes that iodine, you put it in, and it takes care of all that bad taste, and it turns the water clear again. That neutralizing tablet is like Christ. He is united with us. And when he's united with us, till it's just one solution, we are united as one, then he works in us to bring about a change. He purifies us within. This is one of, if not the most, major themes in the Bible. This topic of abiding in Christ and him in us. Paul calls it the mystery of God. The mystery of God is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul referred to this mystery as a body where Christ is the head and believers are members of that body, members of his flesh and of his bones. This is the mystery, this mystery of God that was spoken of in Revelation 10 when it says that at the end of time, this mystery will be completed as God preached to his servants, the prophets. So we should expect, when we're looking back through the Bible, to see evidences of this abiding in Christ and him in us. And so it is. From the first chapters of, Revel of, of Genesis all the way to the last chapter of Revelation, we see through signs and symbols and stories and parables and teachings, evidence after evidence 
of abiding in Christ. What I would like to do in our sermon today is go back and take a high-level survey of some of these major passages in the Bible and start to paint a bigger picture of what it means to be in Christ and him in us. And at the end, we're gonna circle back to Romans 8. And hopefully, that text will become very vibrant with meaning as we have seen the bigger picture of what it's referring to. So Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, God told them, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat from that tree, you will surely die. Now let me ask you, in the day that they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, did they die? Yes, no. Something did die, right? Because they were clothed with skins. In Galatians, Paul refers to this and he says, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So back there in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were clothed with these skins. In a sense, they became one with these animals. Now if I say the name Davy Crockett, what's the first thing you think of? Coonskin cap, yep. He wore that coonskin cap, it made him look enough like a raccoon that it became iconic. So it was for Adam and Eve. They wore the skins of these animals. They looked a whole lot like those animals. In symbol, they became united with those animals. Since they were united with those animals, the death of those animals could count for them because they were one with those animals. And symbolically, therefore, they did die, as somebody said. They did die the day that they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But then they were allowed to live on. Of course, it was only a symbol and they did eventually die. But in the reality to which this points, when we are clothed with Christ, his death counts for us, and then we also participate with him in the eternal life that he gives. He allows us to live on forever. God revealed this mystery of union with Christ to Noah. Noah built an ark at God's command, and then he and his family went into that ark They abode within the ark, and then the ark carried them from their old way of life to a new way of life. Peter refers to this experience of Noah, and he says in 1 Peter 3, 21, corresponding to that, to the experience of Noah, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. It's not an external thing. It's that we respond to God in the right way through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. God revealed this mystery to Abraham He called Abraham out underneath the stars, and he said, count the stars if you can. When I was a kid, we visited the Badlands in South Dakota, and we camped somewhere east of the park out on the side of the road. I remember getting out of the vehicle about four o'clock in the morning and looking at the stars. Out there, there's no light pollution. There's no city for miles and miles around no town even, and the stars were incredible. You could see them all the way down to the horizon. When you looked up at the stars, it was like you were just floating in the space. It was something like that for Abraham back in his day. All these stars, there's no way that he could count them. Then God told him, so shall your seed be. Now, Abraham would have understood this promise to mean that his biological descendant would become a mighty nation. And that's the way God let it play out 
since Abraham understood it that way. But there was a greater fulfillment to come. Paul picked up on that fulfillment and he describes it in Galatians 3.16. And he says, now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises given. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So according to Paul, how many seeds did Abraham have? One, right? And who was that seed? It was Christ. Paul then brings out an amazing insight at the end of Galatians 3, the same passage that we were just studying in reference to Adam and Eve. And he says, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And here it is. If ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. When Christ dwells within our hearts, it's to the point that he considers us as members of himself. It is in this sense that Christ, the single seed of Abraham, has, is like the stars of the heavens. He's composed of many parts. God passed this promise to Isaac and then again to Jacob. You remember Jacob fled from his brother Esau and on the way, the first night out, he laid down, he used a stone as a pillow. It was miserable. But then as he slept, a dream came to him. And in that dream, he saw a ladder stretching from earth to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on that ladder. And at the top of the ladder, God was there. And he spoke to Jacob and he told him, he said, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham and Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your seed. Your seed will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the east and west and north and south. And in you and in your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. So God here gave a visual depiction and a verbal depiction. In the verbal depiction, he talked about this seed through whom all nations of the earth would be blessed. In the visual depiction, he pictured this ladder with the angels of God bringing the blessings of God to all the earth. This is a fitting picture of the plan of salvation, this ladder. Now we've already seen that the seed represents Christ, this Christ who's composed of many parts, many members of his body. But Christ also applied this ladder symbol to himself, talking with Nathaniel. He said, you'll see greater things than these, greater things than just knowing Nathaniel very well. He said, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, the Father is connected with Jesus. Jesus is connected with believers, and believers extend this offer of union with God to all those who are around them. It is in this sense that the latter depicts the blessings of God coming to the earth. We sing the song, we are climbing Jacob's ladder, but we're not climbing Jacob's ladder. The angels are climbing Jacob's ladder. If we are members of the one and only seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then we are part of Jacob's ladder. God revealed this mystery not only to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob, but he revealed it to Moses. You remember the burning bush. Moses saw this bush. It was burning, blazing with fire, but yet it wasn't consumed. And he said, let me go see this great sight. And as he approached, God spoke to him out of the bush and said, Moses, don't come any closer. For the ground upon which you're standing is holy ground. Remove your sandals. Moses could look at that burning bush. He could observe it from a distance, but he couldn't approach to it. 
Now there was another time where fire from God blazed upon something and it wasn't consumed. You remember the day of Pentecost. Fire fell from God, the Holy Spirit, in the form of this flame. The flame came down and it split apart into multiple tongues and those tongues came and rested upon the heads of the believers. They were blazing with the glory of God, yet they weren't consumed. They got to experience what Moses could only see from a distance. Moses saw one bush, many branches, all blazing with that glory of God, yet not consumed. On the day of Pentecost, the people, there, were, there was one fire, multiple tongues, came to rest on the individuals. All of them were ablaze with the glory of God, yet not consumed. God revealed this mystery again, this mystery of union with Christ, three times in three different signs to Moses there at the burning bush. He told Moses, put your hand in your cloak. He did so, and when he pulled it out, it was leprous, as white as snow. And then he put it back in. He pulled it out again, and this time it was made whole, just like the other one. Jesus has the ability to make his body leprous by attaching leprous sinners to himself. And then he has the ability to cleanse his body by cleansing those sinners. You remember when Jesus, there was a leper that came to him. Jesus reached out his hand. Well, the leper asked him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him. And he said, I am willing, be clean. Now in the Levitical law, if someone touched a leper, they became unclean. Jesus defiled himself ceremonially so that he could cleanse this leper. And that's what he does with you and me. He makes us part of himself. He connects us with him. In so doing, in a sense, he defiles himself, but then he cleanses himself. God gave another sign to Moses. He said, take water and pour it out upon the dry ground. Moses did so, and when he did, it turned into blood. Jesus takes the living water of the Holy Spirit and he pours it out in our dry and thirsty souls, and it becomes his life within us, his blood coursing through our veins. And then God gave Moses a third sign. He said, take your staff, and throw it down. When Moses did, that staff became a snake. Then God had him reach out and grasp the snake by the tail, and it turned back into a rod. This became known as the rod of God. It was the rod that Moses took with him back to Egypt to set the children of Israel free. It was the rod that Aaron used in the court of Pharaoh, threw it down, and it became a snake again there. This time, God let it play out a little further though. The Egyptian magicians threw down their staves. They also became snakes, and then Aaron's snake went around and ate up all their snakes. You see where this is going? This snake represented Jesus. Jesus internalized those other snakes, so to speak, into himself made them one with himself. This symbol of the snake continued to play out in the history of Israel. You remember in the wilderness, the people rebelled against God and poisonous snakes came in among them and bit some of them and some of them died. Then God had Moses create a bronze serpent and hang it on a pole. And he said, whoever looks at this bronze serpent, if they're bitten by those snakes, if they will just look at this bronze serpent, they will live. This serpent was a symbol of Christ. Jesus applied it to himself. He said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Paul said, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Typically in the Bible, a snake is a symbol of Satan and evil. But here it's a symbol of Christ. 
He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. This staff, the one that was thrown down there in the court of Pharaoh, was the staff that Moses and Aaron used to lead the children of Israel that brought down all these plagues and ultimately resulted in them coming out of Egypt. It's what resulted in them being freed from bondage. This staff that represented union with Christ. This was the staff that Moses held up over the Sea of Israel and the way was parted. This was the staff that he held in his hand during the battle with the Amalekites. And as his arms got tired, he let that staff down. Some people think he was standing on the hill just in a posture of prayer with his hands raised. But it clearly says, if you actually read the text, that he was to stand on that hill with his, the staff of God in his hands. As he let that staff down, the children of Israel started to lose. As he raised the staff up again, then they started to win. Now in my line of work as an engineer, sometimes we have products that fail and we have to do root cause analysis where we trace that ultimate root cause back and identify what happened. The greatest evidence that we've actually uncovered the real root cause is the ability to turn the failure on and off. And so it was in that battle with the Amalekites. When Moses held up that staff that represented union with Christ, the people won. The way was made clear for them to move forward to the promised land. In our lives, when we focus on our union with Christ, being members of his body, and letting him work in us through the power of his Holy Spirit, then we advance toward the promised land. In our families, when we hold up this staff, this topic of union with Christ and promote that, then our families advance. And so with our churches, God revealed this mystery of union with Christ in the Passover service. You remember the people were to remove all leaven from their houses. This was just like the altar of burnt offering where they were never to offer leaven on that altar. It's as though their houses became a temporary altar, if you will, just to illustrate some aspects of the plan of salvation that were difficult to illustrate in the sanctuary service itself. After they had removed the leaven from their houses, they were to slay the Passover lamb and take its blood and put it on their doorposts and lintel. Then they were to go into their house. How do you get in the house? You walk through the door, right? That door was the one that was blood-stained. They walked through this blood into the house. And while they were in that house, they were to take the body of the Passover lamb, roast it in the fire, and eat it. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. And we are to eat his body. Just as Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. There are so many passages in the Old Testament that talk about this mystery. There were the miracles of Elisha. Almost all of them illustrated union with Christ. One of the first ones that he did, there was a city. And the situation of the city was nice, but the water was bad and it made the land unfruitful. And the people complained to Elisha about this. And Elisha said, bring me a new jar with salt in it. He then took that salt and he poured it out in that water. And he said, thus says the Lord, I've purified these waters. Let there never be death or impurity from them again. In the same way, Christ is united with us. And when he comes into our hearts, he cleanses us within. There was the young man's ax head that flew off when he was down by the Jordan River. They were cutting some wood and this ax head flew off into the water and the young man said, oh no, this was a borrowed ax. What am I gonna do? And Elisha took a branch, he cut it off and he threw it 
into the water. And then that axe head floated to the branch. And when that axe head floated, then it was recoverable. And so with Christ, when he connects us with himself, he makes us recoverable. Elisha did a miracle even after he died, or God did a miracle through him. There were two men who were burying a friend of theirs, preparing his body for burial, and they looked up, and they saw a marauding band coming toward them. So quickly they took the body, and they threw it into Elisha's tomb. And when that body came in contact with those bones, then he came to life. So it is with us in Christ. When we are united with the man who died, Christ Jesus, then we are raised to life. There are many other passages in the Old Testament, and time fails to tell about them all. There was the Psalms of David, the prophecies in Jeremiah about the new covenant, the prophecy in Isaiah about Emmanuel, God with us. There was the Old Testament sanctuary service and all the aspects of that. That is a gold mine of of teachings and allegories about union with Christ. I just mentioned these things for your own study so that you can go back later and through this lens of abiding in Christ and him in us, then you can restudy these passages to see their full meaning. But let's move to the New Testament. Jesus talked about this union with himself. He said, well, he normally compared it to the kingdom of God. That's the terminology he used to describe it. He said, the kingdom of God does not come with signs to be observed, nor will they say, here it is, or there it is, for the kingdom of heaven is within you. Jesus talked about this internal kingdom, comparing it to a woman who took a measure of flour and put in some leaven into it, and it mixed all into the dough, and then it leavened that dough through and through. That's the way with Christ. He works in our hearts and creates a change within us as he is united with us. Jesus revealed the mystery of union with Christ to Matthew, or in Matthew. He revealed it to Peter. Matthew, or (laughs) uh, Peter confessed and said that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus turned around and he said, I say to you, You are Peter, Petras, a piece of rock. And upon this Petra, this mighty rock formation, I will build my church. What he was telling Peter is, Peter, you are Peter, a piece of the rock, me. You are a piece of the mighty rock formation. And upon this rock, I will build my church. This is a rock that grows, just like Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar saw. One time I went caving in a cave not too awful far from here. And way back in the cave, there were some stalactites that had been broken off. And we got to looking at those stalactites, and they looked like tree rings on the inside. As the mineral-rich water flowed down over the stalactite, it left layers, these little deposits, one upon the other upon the other. And that stalactite grew. That's the way it is with the kingdom of God. His kingdom grows layer upon layer as you and I extend the invitation of union with Christ to those who are around us. God revealed this mystery to John. In fact, John wrote his book specifically for two purposes. First, that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God and that believing you may have life in his name. And he alternates between these two themes all the way through his book. Sometimes he brings forth witnesses that declare that Jesus was the Christ, and other times he brings out teachings and parables and allegories to demonstrate what it means to have life in his name. He begins the book, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God. And 
the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So according to this passage, how many sons does God have? One, right? Jesus was his only begotten Son, the one who is called the Word. How then can you and I be called children of God? Thankfully, John doesn't leave us in the dark, but he says, to as many as received him, the word, to as many as received him, to them gave he the right to be called children of God, even to those who believe in his name, his name being the word. Now, this isn't a legalistic sort of thing where we have to attain to a certain level of righteousness before God receives us. What God is looking for is the right attitude, an attitude of repentance, where we continually, as he reveals his will, we continually align with that will, depending on him for the strength all the while to make it happen. So Jesus gives us the right to be called children of God because he dwells within us. And when he dwells within us, since he is the son of God, he's a child of God, that makes us children of God. Jesus revealed this mystery in the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. His mother came to him and said, they have no more wine. Jesus responded in a rather strange way, and he said, woman, what does that have to do with us? My time has not yet come. His time for what? For doing a miracle? His mother wasn't asking him to do a miracle. And besides, if it wasn't the right time for him to do a miracle, he wouldn't have turned around and done one. Every other time in the book of John, when Jesus talks about his time or his hour, it was in reference to his death. It was not time yet for him to give his blood to quench the thirst of the world. But he gave a sign there at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee of what he would later provide. There were six stone water pots there used for the Jewish ceremony of purification. Jesus had the servants fill those up and then take some of it to the head waiter. And somewhere in that process, it was changed from water to wine. And when the head waiter tasted it, he didn't know where it came from. He's like, wow, this is wonderful wine so with all who will taste Christ. Christ gives us his blood to drink. Now in the old covenant, it was strictly forbidden that the people should drink blood or eat blood. In fact, I had a coworker one time, he went overseas and he came back and he talked about some of the things that he had eaten. And one of the things he ate was blood pudding. When he told me about that, my stomach just kind of turned right there. (laughs) That sounds really gross. So the people under the old covenant were strictly forbidden to eat blood. But on the night before Jesus was crucified, he took a cup and he gave it to the disciples to drink. And he said, this is the cup, my blood of the new covenant. We are to drink his blood Jesus revealed this mystery in the feeding of the 5,000. There was one boy who sacrificed his lunch. Jesus then took that lunch and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and his disciples gave it to the multitude and all who ate had their fill. And then Jesus had the disciples go around and gather up the fragments And they gathered 12 basketfuls, enough for a whole basket per disciple. They had an abundance. And so it is with Christ. The Father sacrificed his Son. Jesus was blessed. He was broken. He was given to the disciples in the form of his teachings. Those disciples then 
passed those teachings on to the whole world, and all who would eat will be filled. And those who will go out and gather up the fragments of Jesus' teachings will have an abundance. The people came to Jesus the next day desiring an ongoing occurrence of this miracle. Just like manna, Moses had provided manna in the, hev- uh, in the wilderness, manna from heaven. And Jesus replied, it wasn't Moses who gave you this manna from heaven. It was my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. The people began to argue among themselves, well, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? But Jesus didn't hold back. In fact, he came around and hit the point even harder. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, not figuratively, symbolically, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now, most of the people, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And they left him. They no longer followed him. But for those who remained, Jesus clarified even further, and he said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. It's not the physical flesh and blood of me that I'm talking about, but it's most definitely part of me. It's my spirit. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. It is by eating the the flesh and blood of the word of God, that we gain life. Jesus revealed this mystery when he healed the blind man. He spat on the ground, and then he made mud with the spit, and he applied it to the man's eyes. It sounds a little gross, but it has an incredible meaning. Then he told the blind man, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man went, and he washed, and he came home seeing. In like manner, it's what comes out of Jesus' mouth, applied to our lives, that cures our spiritual blindness. But when he applies his words to our lives, we've got to act on them, depending on him for the strength, of course. The blind man couldn't heal himself, but he did attempt to follow the instructions of Jesus, and Jesus healed him. Jesus revealed this mystery when he cleansed the temple. He drove out those changing, who were changing the money, and to those who were selling doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. So he called the temple his father's house. The Jews came to him later, demanding a sign from him as to his authority to do these things. And he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Well, the Jews mocked him, but John records Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. He was his father's house. He was the dwelling place for his father. Oh, the deep significance then. When we get to John 14 and Jesus says, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If this passage could be expanded to include the true meaning behind it, it might sound something like this. In my father's house, which is the temple of my body, are many dwelling places, places for you to dwell in me. If it were not so, I would have told you. I've given you many evidences to believe that this might be the case, and if you'd gotten off course, I would have reined you back in. I go to the Father to experience the full measure of union with him, 
to make a place for you. And if I go and make a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself to experience the full measure of union with me so that where I am in the Father, there you may also be. This was the message that God declared in Revelation, a revelation of Jesus Christ in the person of his people. In, John, in Revelation 3, it talks about one of the rewards to the seven churches, how those who overcome, God will make them a pillar in the temple of the Lord. And when I was a kid, I read that verse and thought, I don't know if I want <laughs> that reward. I don't know if I want to be made some block in a building somewhere. But you get to the end of Revelation, and John describes the new Jerusalem. And he says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. At the time when the seven churches are going to be enjoying the rewards of their faithfulness, there is no temple other than the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. He intends to make us members of himself. As John says in 1 John 5, we are in him who is true, that's the Father, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the union that God talks about in the Bible. So let's bring it full circle now, back to Romans 8. In Romans 8, it says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. I want to specifically address or talk to those who feel like you're struggling in the Christian experience this morning. You recognize the beauty of God's law you see the value in aligning your life with it. But in practice, what you find is that when temptation comes along, you succumb to whatever desire might be the strongest at the time. Let me assure you, there is hope. What we need is to abide in Christ and let him abide in us. I had a friend, we worked in lawn care together way back in the day, I was in college. And we got to know one another well and we shared a lot. And he one day confided that he was struggling with a prescription pill addiction. He said, I've got pills in my pocket right now and I could take them and nobody would know. You wouldn't even know. And I said to him, if you muster up all your courage and you decide that you're not gonna take those pills, but you go no further than that, you are bound to lose. We must have a strength beyond what we naturally possess. We must have Christ helping us. I said, cry out to him. Reach out to him in prayer and tell him, Lord, I don't have the strength in me to do what's right but you have the strength. Please work in me to will and to do according to your good pleasure and he'll give you the strength. I said, I'll be praying for you too. Well, we got out of the truck at the next job and we started mowing the lawns and it was a big lawn. It took about two hours to mow it and the whole time I was praying. I was pouring out my heart to God on my friend's behalf we got back to the truck and my coworker had a big smile on his face and he pointed to some white powder on the, on the asphalt and he said, I prayed like you told me to and God helped me and I crushed my pills. The changes in his life after that started to come one after another after another as God worked in him, even in ways that I don't think he was aware of, but God was working in him to move him in the direction that he wanted to go. 
He wanted to follow God wholeheartedly, and God was entirely behind that, helping him every step of the way. And so if you're struggling, there's hope. There is hope in Jesus. Cry out to him, and he will give you a power that you don't naturally possess. He will dwell in your heart. All you have to do is ask him. Jesus said, the Father is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask than an earthly father is willing to give good gifts to his children. And so just ask him for the Holy Spirit. And then take him at his word. Believe that he has helped you and, he, and set out to do what he wants. And he will help you. And he'll change you from within, making you a replication of his character. So as we studied today, life comes from abiding in Christ. And I encourage all of us to abide in Christ and let him abide in us. This is life in Christ Jesus. It's now time for our benediction. After the benediction, the deacons and I will dismiss, but you're welcome to hang out and visit. This is time to make friends. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for the hope that we have in Jesus, that you've not left us to ourselves, that you've not just expected us to go and try to live up to the two great commandments or the Ten Commandments, or any other list of commandments that are external, but that you have given us Jesus with the law written on his heart. And when he comes in and dwells within us, then your law is written on our hearts too. And you work in us through and through like leaven, like salt in the spring. And you cleanse us from within, making us what you want us to be. We are entirely dependent on you. We need your help, but we're also very hopeful because you are faithful and you will help us. We love you. We thank you for the good work that you're doing. Amen.